in just a few moments. In the meantime, please write in the chat box who you are and where you're joining us from. And please also make sure to select your language. To select a language, click on the bottom where you see the globe icon and it will take you to the English or French channel. You can then mute the original audio. Everyone needs to select a language to ensure that you are able to listen to all of our speakers. In addition, you may also select whether or not you'd like to continue to read captions during the session. You should be seeing these captions automatically right now, but if not, you can select them by clicking on the icon with the two C's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you wish to hide the captions later, please select the same icon again and select hide subtitle from the menu that appears. These captions are generated using an automatic feature in Zoom and therefore might not be 100% accurate. On the Zoom platform, captions are only available in English at this time. We're also sharing a few poll questions with you. And as you'll see on the next slide, the questions are in English and French on the slide. If you'd like to read these questions in French, the French translation has been added to the chat box. And as you'll note, the answer choices in the poll itself are in both English and French. So please take a moment, introduce yourself in the chat, who you are and where you're joining us from. Select a language, select if you'd like to continue to read captions during today's session and answer the poll questions while we wait for others to join us. We'll get started in just a moment. Thank you again for joining today. I wanna to welcome everyone again to today's session. My name is Brittany Getch and I'm a program officer on the Knowledge Success Project at Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs. Knowledge Success is excited to be partnering with FP2030 on this series. This is our 15th conversation in the Connecting Conversations series. And if you've missed previous conversations, you can watch the recordings on FP2030's YouTube channel, or read blog post recaps that include recording links on the Knowledge Success site and get up to speed. This conversation will last for approximately an hour and we'll have an open Q&A discussion with our three speakers. It is being simultaneously interpreted into French, as I mentioned, and it's being recorded in both English and French. The recordings will be available in the coming days. If you haven't already done so, please select your language by clicking on the globe icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Please also take this time to select if you'd like to continue reading cl our closed captioning. You may select to hide these captions by clicking on the icon with two Cs at the bottom of the Zoom screen and selecting hide subtitle from the menu that appears. Participants are muted throughout the duration of this conversation, 
But if you have questions for our speakers, please type them in the chat box as you follow along. My Knowledge Success colleagues will be moderating the chat box and we'll get to as many questions as time allows. Just a little bit about this Connecting Conversation series in case you're joining us for the first time. Connecting Conversations is a series of discussions on adolescent and youth reproductive health hosted by FP2030 and Knowledge Success. Through the end of this year, we'll be co-hosting these sessions every few weeks on a variety of topics. The series has been divided into five themes, and we began with a look at a foundational understanding of adolescent development and health. We continued our conversations by exploring engaging critical influencers to improve young people's reproductive health. And our third theme focused on adolescent responsive services and began on March 4th and concluded on April 29th of this year. We're excited to continue this set of conversations on key, pop, key youth populations with a discussion on very young adolescents and leveraging this key life stage to improve SRH. Before I introduce today's moderator, I wanna begin by looking at the poll answers. So if we could bring those up. Great, thank you. The first question, if you're looking for data on very young adolescents and sexual and reproductive health, what sources do you use? There are several different options in terms of answers, government ministries, agencies, non-governmental organizations, global organizations or global studies, a combination of sources, not sure, or there's no data available on very young adolescents. It looks like the majority of you selected a combination of stories. And this is something that our speakers will touch on uh, later on in the discussion. The second question, does your country have a national policy that supports very young adolescents access to SRH information and services? Yes, no, or not sure. And the majority of you selected yes, which um, is great to hear. And our speakers and our moderator will be touching more on different policies and an enabling policy environment for very young adolescents. And the third question, how well are very young adolescents integrated into existing adolescent SRH programming in your country? Not at all, somewhat and extremely well. And the majority of you said somewhat. Again, the speakers will be touching on integrating very young adolescents into existing SRH programming, as well as designing new programming with very young adolescents in mind. Thank you all for answering those poll questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's conversation. With a degree in medical anthropology and a doctorate in international health, Dr. Kristen Mari has been extensively trained in cross-cultural research, qualitative methods and analysis, and program evaluation. She is the Director of Qualitative and Implementation Research for the Global Early Adolescent Study, GEAS, which is a 10 country study aimed at exploring how the acquisition of gender norms and gender socialization shapes very ad early adolescent relationships and health behaviors. Additionally, she co-chairs the Adolescent Health Focal Area of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative at Johns Hopkins and is leading three additional studies among vulnerable adolescents in Baltimore to explore how various contexts, the neighborhood, school, and family influence adolescents' health. Welcome, Kristen. We're so excited to have you. Over to you. Thank you so much, Brittany, and it's a pleasure for me to be here and to engage with all of you and hopefully a really exciting conversation about very young adolescents. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our three amazing speakers for today. Uh, I will first start with Lilibet Namakula, and she is from Public Health Ambassadors Uganda. Lilibet holds a master's degree in public health from the University of West England. And she has worked with a variety of leaders, trendsetters, and influencers at all levels to coordinate and implement community-based programs aimed at improving and prioritizing the health needs of young people and their communities. As a program manager of Public Health Ambassadors Uganda, Lilibeth has been working for the past five years on conducting health education and promotion activities, mentoring youth activists, becoming change agents in their own communities and supporting project proposal development, planning and implementation, budget management and partnership building. Wow. 
Now I will turn to our second speaker, who is Sirkadis Admasu from CARE Ethiopia. Sirkadis holds a bachelor's degree in nursing and a master's degree in public health. And as part of her master's uh, thesis, she conducted research on early adolescence awareness of sexual and reproductive health rights. She has more than 15 years of experience in implementing, leading, and designing gender transformative uh, sexual and reproductive health programs. And currently, Sirkadis is the program manager for ACT With Her at CARE Ethiopia, which is a project co-implemented with and led by Pathfinder International. In this role, she oversees CARE's implementation of the project in two regions of Ethiopia, which serves over 20,000 young adults by um, close of 2022. The last speaker is Tisungana Sitima from Environmental Concerned Youth Association in Malawi. Tisungani is a sexual reproductive health rights champion and has been working with adolescent girls since 2018. She holds a bachelor's of science in gender and development and her past research has focused on assessing factors that influence contraceptive use among adolescents. She currently is working with the Environmental Concern Youth Association as a sexual and reproductive health programs officer. So quite an impressive group here. So now let's turn to the discussion. So I am going to ask um, some questions and I'm going to have each of you take turns and we'll just rotate that way. Um, so the first question to just get us started in this topic is we know now that countries are becoming much more aware of the needs of very young adolescents, but they're currently, they're still very underserved in programming. So let's start off then. When we think about very young adolescents, who are we talking about? And why is this life stage so critical? So Lilibet, why don't you st start us off? Oh, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I, I, first of all, I want to say thank you for being involved in such an interesting conversation. For someone who comes from Uganda, a country that has its largest population as young people, I'm very happy to be here. When I talk about an adolescent, I'm thinking about a young person that is between the ages of 10 and 19. And to me, this is a very critical age because during this time, they're going through a number of changes, physical changes, emotional and psychological changes, behavior changes, and even the social pressure of having them transition from childhood to adulthood. So there's a number of challenges and issues that they're facing in between. So this is why I'm excited to be talking about this today. Great, and, and just to follow up with that one point before I turn it on, um, to other speakers, um, very. How do you how do you classify very young adolescents as opposed to other adolescent groups? We're talking about the very young. Okay, so for me, when we talk about the very young adolescents, mm -hmm. we're talking about the the ones that are fourteen and below. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That okay. is a very much. That is a, a very critical age that is oftentimes left out. Mm -hmm. If you look at most of the, 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 the documents and the documentation that's written about adolescents, usually they're looking at 15 onwards, and they very much leave out the 14 and below. Great. Yep. So, Kadis, anything you'd like to add to that as to what Lilibet just was mentioning? Yeah, sure. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah, as little bit said, these age groups are uh, 10 to 14, and they are not the uh, major for, for the community mostly. They belong to, uh, they are not uh, an adult or they are not child. So it's a very difficult thing when you say like you have to reach them, you have to reach this age group. So mostly the child, this group are, uh, making a dynamic transition and they are facing multi-dimensional changes. It could be social or biological, but still 
the community or especially the larger population won't uh, appreciate those changes. They still want to keep them, especially the early ones, 10 to 14, they still want to keep them as, um, as the younger child then children and the, 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 the challenge mostly is that now most um, development or, uh, organizations in the government is itself like for example in Ethiopia acknowledge something must be done there must be an intervention that's tailored to this age group but the challenge still is there is there is a work need to be done on the buy-in awareness creation that these adolescents are really passing into different complex challenges so we have to help them and this is an opportunity to work to build because most of the behaviors social norms are built at this stage uh, if you see the girls are mostly restricted to be at home and the boys are allowed to have are given to be man uh, to be to demonstrate a manly behavior at this stage to start to demonstrate so this is a right time to intervene but still there is some reservation i mean the government fears the backlash of the community and the back the community feels whatever we intervene will make them uh, contemplate or we are we are taking something they don't know so there is a resistance so that that's i think still the limitation but is but it is a good opportunity to intervene and shape the behaviors, attitudes, norms that be, uh, that govern the future generation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. And Tisugani, maybe you could touch a little bit more about, it, and especially like in Malawi, like what makes this age group different from the older adolescents and why is it so hard maybe to even reach them in, in programming? Tisugani, you're muted. Sorry. There you Hi, go. Hi, you can hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Thank you so much for um for including me in this conversation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh when I hear about adolescents, as my friends has already said that um it is uh, age from 10 to 19. And the very young adolescents, which ranges from 10 to 14, they are, are like facing a lot of um, sexual and reproductive healthy challenges. This is because um, when they are transitioning from childhood to adulthood, they, they do change physically, psychologically, and also socially. So the physical development and the psychological development influences their social well-being thereby they they need to explore what the world is it all about how do people do things and what if they do this and um, also what can come uh, after they do that so when they're exploring they explore without um necessarily or information about whatever they are doing especially when it comes to sexual and reproductive health uh, unfortunately our policies are not focused uh, our sex i mean our sexual and reproductive health policies are not focusing mainly on uh, 10 to 14. they are starting from maybe 16 upwards which is a very big problem and this is a very good platform that uh we're now targeting 10 to 14 how 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 they can go about the sexual and productive problems they are facing how can we help them so that they have much understanding of how they can handle themselves whenever they are passing through these stages Great, wonderful. Um, and yeah, just to let everyone know too, when we're talking about very young adolescents, as, as the speaker said, it's 10 to 14. Um, and they're often overlooked because many countries and policies, as Tisugani was, was talking about, um, especially when we're in the realm of sexual and reproductive health, we don't think of this age group as being part of that. And it's true. Um, many of them have not yet engaged in any kind of sexual um, intercourse or, re or activity. But that doesn't mean that a lot of times we focus on them too late then at the age of 15 when a lot of them have. So this is a one way that, that I've, I've heard folks classify this age group as kind of a window of opportunity. This is a perfect time for us to work because yes, 
um, it's a critical stage of development. They're rapidly growing and um, and um, this, this would be an opportune time for programs to then take advantage of this. Um, so let's then turn to like the research then. And what do we know about this age group, the 10 to 14 year olds? What does research so far um, say about this group that is important for sexual and reproductive health programming? Um, maybe I'll have Sir Cadiz, um start us off. Yeah, there are lots of researchers recently coming out. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, now, now uh, this age group is a window of opportunity to intervene to work on because most are not uh, sexually active, but still are um, in adolescence in the passing a, a different stage. So research suggested that suggests um, to have to consider their differences while we are designing program, especially the SRHR program, because though they are, these early adolescent groups are very young and there are different things that we have to consider. And the differences um, in adolescence is, is like, there are different variables, cultural, social, gender, it's a very complex by its nature. So we have to consider all these things or take into consideration these critical variables whenever we try to approach or design a program uh, or to address their SRHR needs. So um, obviously there is, I just want to focus more on the gender differences and obviously there uh, is a difference between um, the biological change between girls and boys, the girls get more faster in, the, in their biological uh, development and the boys came later. So one, whatever we um, design for should focus on that, even though they, they this are the same age group. And uh, girls happen to be more vulnerable population when it comes to uh, this uh, SRHR, mostly because of uh, how the gender norms affect them. And for example, the girls are restricted at this age group to be at home and um, they are more restricted. So their movements are more monitored and restricted when they reach uh, this age group. And that will limit them not to have the right information and access for service, uh, whatever they need. And their, their, uh, their parents and guardians influence is huge at this time. So, a girl's focused intervention is very important and it will help the girls to thrive. For example, research showed that a program that focuses on improving girls' education, supporting them with menstrual, menstrual hygiene, and creating safe space, supporting system for the girls will help them to thrive to reach uh, their goals and their aspiration. But this doesn't mean we don't need to work on their, the others surrounding them, particularly the boys. It's also critical involving the boys because it allows one to ensure their specific needs and the other is, it will allow us uh, to help them to have empathy and uh, support for the girls, which means they will have, we will have uh, a, a gender equality attitude and the, the supportive uh, generation and partnership for the future. So it, addressing all on the social ecological system to have a better outcome of uh, a SRHR outcome would be uh, need to involve all surrounding the girl, but more focused girl, girls focused um, projects would be effective. That's what I see as a research, as I found, um, I read many articles. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. <laughs> great, great. Um, Tisugani, let's let's ask you then. What what do you know? What has the research told you about what we know about this age group? That is it relevant for sexual and reproductive health programming? And you're muted, Tisugani again. Sorry, sorry. No worries. Yes, <laughs> it is it is very important um, for sexual programs to uh, these young adolescents. Because as we have already uh, explained that, these young people, when they are transitioning, more especially um, 
girls, they do explore. And the problem is that they do not ask their parents what they can do because um, mostly um, nowadays parents are not being open to their children. They take them to be children who cannot do anything bad or maybe they cannot engage in sexual uh, activities, but uh, adolescents out there are engaging in sexual activities. They are experiencing them, they are testing, they're doing everything they can just to know how uh, how they can how they can have sex with one another or maybe um, they they all need to uh, taste what it feels like. So leaving them behind it's a very big problem because if we if we do not help them at this age, we're going to face so many active, uh, so many problems in the future. For example, the contraction of HIV, because they might be have, uh, they might be engaging in sexual activities without having much knowledge about it, without having much knowledge on how they can protect themselves, without um, having much knowledge on where they can access maybe sexual and reproductive healthy services. So it is very important for uh, for us to increase the um, the life skills starting from primary, where these age groups um, we can find these age groups. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lilibet. Can we expand on this um, discussion about what we know about this? And one thing I'd I'd like you to maybe touch a little bit on is. Um, we've heard a lot about kind of girls being restricted and, and there seems to be an increased emphasis on girls um, in this age group. But what do we do? We know anything about boys? Should we just ignore boys in this age group? Tell us about what 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 what, what, what should we think about in terms of 10 to 14 year old boys and their risks? OK, um, thank you, Christine. Um, I. I... First of all, I think I wanted to build on what my colleague said. It, it, we are very much often looking closer at the girls because they are considered more vulnerable. I can give an example. I've worked with a lot of um, children that are getting their period faster and faster. You know, by the age of eight, someone has started their period. And they're confused. They're wondering what exactly is happening. Why am I bleeding to death? And how can this help me? But this is a period where, unfortunately, for some communities, once you've had your period, it's now they're now considering the fact that you have grown, you've reached adulthood, you're ready for marriage, you should go off and have children. So I think automatically that's why we are triggered, or that's why we're more pushed to think about the girls. But the boys are very vital as well because girls don't live in a vacuum. Anything that happens to a girl also is, has a contribution from the boys. Girls don't menstruate in a vacuum. If I menstruate and I'm being bullied by the boy that I'm being with, it's going to have an effect on me wanting to go to school the next day. But most importantly, I think for me, no matter if it's a boy or a girl, it's, I've noticed that it's important to note that young adolescents are different. So they have different needs and they have different um, worries, you know? So it's then up to us to create the different opportunities, you know, with the supportive environment, with a safe and supportive environment, with um, to provide them the information that they need, be it a boy or a girl to help them build the life skills that they need, to help them go through just the phase of adulthood, but through life. And then also to provide the counseling and the health services that they need. Not thinking about, oh, because they're young adolescents, they are asexual, they don't know anything about sex, no. 
they need youth friendly services that are going to listen to them and provide the actual service that they need. Thank you. Great. So um, I just want to touch on a few things. I think those are all really important things that aspects of very young adolescents that you all brought up. And just to make a plug for my the, the study that I'm working on, the Global Early Adolescent Study, one of the things that we've learned um, from our research is that, first of all, and, and just looking at the context of boys and girls in different um, cultural settings, there are a lot of similarities, but there also are very different, different um, aspects in a boys and girls upbringing that direct them to different types of risks. So for example, you've already mentioned this, but I think it's an important point for everyone to understand is that before puberty, before they start developing, boys and girls are relatively, they play together. They, they're childhood friends. Nobody makes a big deal out of it. But it's as soon as they start approaching this age that we've learned that there's a separation of boys and girls. And in many contexts, there's girls especially are receiving messages, boys can no longer be trusted. You shouldn't be in the company of boys. And they get that from especially parents, they get that also from teachers, from the media, even from their friends. And what does that do then? It makes them seem like they're different so that we're already trying to separate them and make, you know, they're unequal in, in many ways. And so what we've also shown, and you've already mentioned, is that parents then, because of this, they keep their girls closer. So girls, girls' space is restricted. Whereas boys, they start developing, they're seen as strong, oh, they don't need our protection anymore. They can go. But that also promotes them in, into higher risks environments. They don't have the supervision that girls have in many ways. So there's different types of risks. So just to kind of get our minds around that, that there is many, many different channels that young people are hearing that they're, the opposite sex are different and should not be um, seen together as much as they were as a childhood. And that I think is an important um, concept and, and a research finding that was really interesting, at least for us, that this is across different cultures. This is a common occurrence. So anyways, um, with that though, I'd like to turn to the next question and let's talk then about what are, given these things about early adolescence and how boys and girls are being separated and um, especially during puberty, what are some of the ways that programs can effectively support the participation of very young adolescents in the design of the programs? What are some strategies? Uh, let's start with Tisugani. Okay. Um, for us to help these young adolescents, they need to have more information about sexual and reproductive health. They need to have access to sexual and reproductive health services. They need to be treated equally because they all experience um, they experience different things, but they but they pass through the same period, puberty and the like. So it is much better for youth friendly health services to be provided in uh, every part of the. Uh, every part of the country where it is a clinic or a, or, or a health center and also some uh, activities in schools, maybe uh, clubs where, can, uh, where adolescent boys and girls can be sharing experiences and also there can be uh, counseling sessions for them to have much knowledge and understanding on, of, of themselves and also life skills um, subjects in uh, starting from primary, secondary, and also uh, to the, the colleges so that they, 
they should be built in this thing. They should have knowledge on how they can handle themselves, on how they can relate with one another. They should they shouldn't be seeing each each other differently. They should be relating. They should be doing everything together. They should um, they should have that uh, courage to take care of themselves, even though they started they, they start period or. or experiencing maybe uh, some um, development and growth physical um, experiences. Let's say there, there are some, um, there are some physical changes that they go through. So whenever they are being taught about these things, they are giving, they are giving much information about the development the physical development that, that they pass through, they'll be able to know that this is uh, just a menstruation. I can help myself by doing this. So this is um, sexual pressure. I can help myself by doing this, not necessarily engaging into sexual uh, activities or maybe the other way around, but they will help them. They can build them to have much knowledge and also to to be living a positive life. Thank you. Um, let's turn to Lilibet. And I want to talk about like, if, if we do want very young adolescents, though, actually in helping design the program, though, how can we do that? What's what are some strategies that that you've maybe been part of that have worked? Um, thank okay. you. Christine. We'll, we'll turn it to Lilibet and then um, Tisugani, if you have any other points, you can, uh, I'll come back to you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Christine. Um, actually, um, one of, because when I read this question, I thought, okay, what is that vital thing? And I think the most vital one is that these young adolescents need to be engaged and they need to be involved at every single stage of planning the, the program, of implementing the program, of monitoring, but also following up and giving feedback. Um, we've had an opportunity to work with PSI Uganda in coming up with a youth brand called Your Space. So what happened is that we had, we met up with a number of young people, adolescents, it was, a number of young people from across the country. And we sat down and our discussion was, what do you want? What do you not want? What challenges have you been expressing? What, how can we do it better? And so we ended up coming up with a youth brand called Your Space, which through the youth brand, we've been able to reach out to a number of people across the country and generally increase access to contraception, to increase access and availability of services that are, yes, sexual and reproductive health services, but are tailored and that are properly presented for young people. But in addition to helping them have access and helping and allowing them to be in deeply entailed in every part of the intervention, we also need to remember that these young people, many of them are still dependent. They're dependent on their parents, on their communities, on their schools. So even while we're looking at engaging and involving those young adolescents, we need to know that it also has, it starts from the community. I've gone to a lot of schools and the teachers are complaining that the parents are not saying anything to their children. They leave the whole aspect of sexual and reproductive health and counseling and information to us as the teachers, which is a very big load, considering that in Uganda, you might have a teacher addressing up to 50 and above students. So when are you going to get time to individually counsel or redirect one of those young adolescents? Was also had a project um, a menstrual hygiene project in Ajumani, which is a refugee and a host community. And through this project that started out as a pilot in schools, 
we were able to realize that even while we wanted to talk to the young women and the young girls, we had to go through the school administration because they are the ones that spent a lot of time with those girls. From that pilot, we moved on to reach out to the other girls that were out of school within that community, within the refugee community and the host community. But through this, we used the different community health extension workers. We used the VSLAs, which are village loans and savings groups. Those women in those groups were tasked, they were given information and trained. Then they were tasked to go out into the community and talk to the young people, talk to their parents, talk to this local leader who is the most verbal and most difficult when it comes to the different meetings. Have them get this information, understand why this young person is important and why they need to have this information and then grow from there. So it's not just about the young person, but it's also about the people around that young person that we can trigger and reach out to. Even in, I want, even because we were talking about the point before, we're not talking about how about the boys. Even in these trainings and the people, the, the different community people that we have trained and the young people that we have reached out to. Yes, girls are a major part, but boys are very important because they are the ones that allow the girls to think, okay, I'm not being judged. I'm not, they're not judging me. They're not going to laugh at me and giggle in the background. But then you get a boy who stands up and says, yes, this, I know this, this, this about menstruation. I'm going to go and train my sister and my family and tell my mother and my auntie. And he's a champion, he's taking lead. So I think in addition to involving the young people, working with the community is very vital as well. Great, thank you, Lilibet. And Sir Goddess, let's turn to you. And just um, if you could add a little bit, we've, we've heard some about the challenges of working with very young adolescents. Sometimes you have to go through the school administrators. Um, have you seen any kind of, maybe you could just touch on what are some successful models, if you've seen any of, of working with very young adolescents? Or maybe if you haven't yet, what are some things that you can draw on that might make it possible to improve the engagement of very young adolescents in the design of a program? Yeah, thank you again for the opportunity. Let me start with the successful ones. Um, for example, for the current project that we are working with, Actuator our project, uh, what we did is to engage, um, I mean, we need a first place, we need a, a very uh, real information about their status to design a project. We know what they want, with what they don't want, or what they attract them, or what is not attracting for them, rather than having a design and giving them, start implementing and um, prepare oneself to fail. So what we did is we involved them um, in a focus group discussion to, to understand what they really feel about uh, the, some of the things that we are, we want to address. To specific, for example, to be specific, for example, there was a, a, an in-kind or we call it asset transfer that we want to give for the girls. If you ask parents, there there are different sets of things that they want their adolescents to get. But when we talk to uh, when we talk. When we take time to talk to the adolescents, these early adolescents, 10 to 14, we sat together and we just brainstorm what they really want to be supported on. Uh, it, it could be to remain uh, in a school. It could be uh, to delay early marriage. And uh, interestingly, their findings, uh, the finding is uh, a very interesting what the girls say that will keep them uh, in school or not to marry because some of the things as a parent or as adult, when you see it, it might not have substance, but that has a lot of influence. For example, having this um, sanitary materials or beauty materials, those are the things that will push them to marry early because the one who gets uh, married early will dress up good, she has jewelries and the likes. So this is only maybe the reason for them to run into marriage that's the pushing or pulling factor for them. So involving them with focus group discussion to have their own view, 
testing the materials or the approach with them to see how they feel about is it boring or is it attractive how to how to approach them identifying uh, the right time to get them to meet them for the discussion or to trans uh, transmit the message you want uh, who are the influencers on them uh, when is better for them I mean, uh, there are other, some adolescents are very supportive for family, so it might not be easy even to contact them, or they are not allowed to go to school. So involving them during the assessment, having them as much having as much as possible, uh, much data or information against those critical uh, variables that I mentioned earlier, like age, context. Uh, their desires, needs would be helpful. So to do that, you can involve them with focus group uh, discussion. One of the challenge on that would be having an ethical clearance. So you should have that uh, because you can't gather early adolescent start discussion out of uh, blue. So you have to secure that and you have you can involve. Then once the implementation is started, once you have a well-developed um, program, then you can have their feedback uh, uh, through different means that uh, they can reflect whatever is not convenient. As one of my friend was saying earlier, they are under someone's um, supervision. So adolescent programming must be highly flexible. It should have an adaptive management. If your design is now working this way, then you will, with the feedback you get from the adolescents, you have to be flexible to change it to what uh, it fits for them. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, we're going to turn it now to some of the um, audience's questions that are being posted. We're getting a lot of them and time is running out. So I want to make sure that we get some of their questions um, addressed. So there are quite a few um, questions that are around um, just the norms around talking to young people about sexual and reproductive health. So one, um, several panelists or not panelists, but audience members are asking, how do we address the sexual and reproductive health needs of very young adolescents when discussing these issues is very taboo? So um, Tisugana, do you wanna go and, and, and tackle this question? Yes. Yeah, um, it is very difficult for, uh, let's say ad ad activists or maybe ad advocates to talk about sexual and reproductive health rights with these young adolescents. For example, here in Malawi, our policy, our policy, like education policy, restricts um, comprehensive sexual and reproductive health for um, in like in primary school. Uh, when we look at the adolescent age 10 to 19, a lot of them are in primary schools. And we cannot write here, this, these people, these children are engaging in different activities. And also they are facing a lot of problems concerning the, this period. So it is very much hard for someone like me to go to a primary school to talk about sexual and reproductive health to these young ones. And also it is very much difficult for me to go to a village to talk about sexual and reproductive health among these adolescents. I would love to um, engage um, different stakeholders, for example, traditional readers talk to them, explain to them what is it really important about sexual and reproductive health among adolescents, how can this help them, how can this help their life and also for them to attain uh, education and achieve what they want. So I, I can share you the experience that I have. Um, I am also volunteering at UNECO as Dreams Facilitator, facilitating uh, Dreams Girls Clubs, whereby we teach girls about sexual and reproductive health and also some life skills. Uh, this other day, I was I was talking about the same sexual and reproductive but on HIV part, and then they were like. Um, 
we cannot we cannot say much about sexual and uh, sexual uh, 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 reproductive health or maybe sexual activities because our community our society does not allow us to talk about that and when they when they go home you find that their parents are now coming to you why were you talking uh, about sexual reproductive health with my children what are you expecting them to do you are driving them to be engaged in sexual uh, activities so it's very difficult for for us on the ground to uh, to help the young adolescents but it should start from up there our policies need to change they need to be addressing these adolescents maybe removing the gap allowing them to have um access to comprehensive uh, sexual and reproductive health and also our traditional readers need to understand uh, what is it all about sexual and reproductive health and also how can this help our adolescents because if we delay now as i said already we're going to have a lot of problems concerning sexual and reproductive health starting from this age Great. I'm going to have to just, uh, we, we're running out of time. So all of um, speakers will, will need to make sure your answers are a little shorter just so that we can get all the questions in. But thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm going to jump to the next question. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Sercatus about this question. So um, young people or youth organizations often struggle to implement programs in the face um, of the lack of support from partners, donors, or governments. How can we advocate for programs for very young adolescents? What are some of your thoughts on that? Yeah, my primary suggestion would be using youth advocates to advocate for uh, these programs because, I mean, building the capacity of the youth and uh, adolescents, older adolescents, is to equal the problem of the adolescents rather than we seeing it, the community, even the government and the donors more are more convinced when they hear it from them. So mm -hmm. it's some work on capacity building and uh, let them have a meaningful contribution. It's not just to say I have involved or engaged users, but they meaningfully will be with knowledge, with all the capacity you, that they need. So put them at, at the front would be helpful. And having evidences are surround, uh, whenever you talk about this problem, it should be a tan there should be a tangible evidence. Because the community, the first thing everyone will ask is, this has been like this for years, nothing changed. And what, why are you, what are you trying to change right now? Are you trying to change cultures or are you doing something else? It's not, so you have to show them with evidence that this is a real problem that exists. But I just want to say one thing on the first question about how to work with very young adolescents where the norm is, the taboo is high. I said just to work on parallelly on norms while you are working, empowering on very young adolescents. That will have a great uh, advantage and also ensure the buy-in of the community with evidence again so that they appreciate the problem. Uh, before reaching or going to adolescents. Thanks so much. Great. And and Lilibet, I'm going to have you say the last few points on either question you can address. But any additional thoughts on kind of how do we talk to young people given these norms and how do we address these norms um, and engage different people at multiple levels? OK, so I'm excited because I had an answer that I felt crossed across both the questions. Um, Working for a youth-led and youth-serving organization, we have had a number of struggles. So we had to think creatively. What do we do? First of all, knowledge is power. But more importantly, I, Lilibet, cannot go to a community and speak to them. They, they don't know me. They don't know my story. They won't trust me. But if I pick on a, a champion or someone who has a point of influence, someone who has platforms that, that they like, that they listen to, that they trust. Information is more likely to get down to the parents, even the adolescents. But one of my favorite, and which is our niche as public health ambassadors Uganda, 
is edutainment. The smallest thing, you can package the most dangerous of topics in a skit, in a poetry song, in a, in a rap, in a dance, and it will, be, it will be received. If we're dealing with communities on a, on a, on a difficult topic, we'll bring it through drama. You know, we have what they call community theater. We do it, it's like a start and stop game. They act out something and pause. We discuss it. What do you think? Who is right in this situation and who is wrong? Stuff like that. And then for the children, we use competitions, you know, to help them express themselves, to help them build and to show their community that they actually have something to say. I love it. I think that is so important, especially when we're dealing with this age group. We have to appeal um, to what they like and what, you know, and so yes. for some of us adults that may be stepping out of our comfort zones and, and finding out how to work with that type of media platform. Um, so thank you so much, um, all of you speakers. It was just a great conversation. Um, I can't believe how quickly time has um, left us. Um, but that just goes to show how interesting a discussion this is and how important I think this topic is. So I really want to thank each of you for sharing your insights with us. Um, I just want to summarize some of the key points to, to kind of walk away with. But um, first is that this is the very young adolescent age group is a very critical stage. We often call it a window of opportunity. Um, we know at this stage that already they're, they've already acquired and in some cases cemented their attitudes and beliefs about gender. So um, it's, and, and there was one person in the audience who said we should suggest, we should start earlier. And I agree with that, but we can think of it as kind of a life course approach um, dealing with this. The other thing that I want to just raise is that this is not a, um, if we're going to really uh, make improvements um, in the sexual and reproductive health, we can't just focus on adolescents um, themselves. There's a lot of different influencers. Um, parents, teachers, all of those, the community needs to be involved. Religious leaders need to be involved. So it's, it's very hard to make any change if we're just focusing on adolescents. And the other thing just to bring up is we have to think about, we have to engage them, have them tell us what's the best approach. So Lilibet, I think your, um, your example of edutainment, that is a, poss that is a great possibility. So um, I just wanna thank you all for sharing all of these things and thank you to our audience. And I think at this point, I will hand it to Brittany um, to say any last things. Thank you everyone for such an engaged uh, discussion. There were so many great questions and comments in the chat. It was wonderful to hear from all of our speakers and our moderator today. Um, again, as a reminder, we'll be posting and sending out a recording of today's webinar um, session. And we hope you'll join us for the next Connecting Conversations on July 22nd at 7 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. If you haven't already done so, you can register at the link in the chat. And we will be exploring young people living in humanitarian settings, addressing SRH needs to avoid compounding crisis. We also encourage you to follow FP2030 and Knowledge Success at the handles and websites that you see on the screen to stay up to date on resources, activities, and upcoming events. Again, thank you speakers and our moderator for joining us today. Time definitely flew by. And I wanna thank you all again for such a great conversation. We'll see you soon on July 22nd at 7 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone, bye. Bye.